what does it mean to win the day? And so we, with us, it's about going one and oh, and not one and oh in the day, but in every aspect of the day. You know, did I get up on time? Right. Did I what did I eat for breakfast? Did I go one and oh for breakfast? Did I did I sit in the front of the classroom and take good notes and really stay focused in class? And did I go one and oh in that class? And there are some classes and or some aspects of the day where maybe you didn't go one and oh. But you know what you have to do is reset and move on to the next thing. And let's go one and oh in the next thing. Cause my definition of toughness is the ability to do the next right thing. Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Today we are joined by the head men's basketball coach at Kansas State University, Jerome Tang. Coach Tang was selected as the 2023 Naismith Men's College Coach of the Year and runner-up for the Associated Press National Coach of the Year after guiding K-State to a 26-10 overall record including a tie for third place in the Big 12 standings and the school's 13th trip to the Elite Eight and the first since 2017-2018. Coach Tang was the consensus Big 12 Coach of the Year by his fellow coaches. I had the pleasure of playing for Coach Tang in his first of 19 seasons as an assistant coach at Baylor. Before we hear from Coach, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamoti Podcast. Well, man, Coach, thank you so much for for doing this, giving up your time. I know you're busy. I uh, want to first say congratulations on an awesome first year. And this is special for me because not only, I mean, are you somebody that I watch closely all year long and really enjoyed watching your teams play, but I had the opportunity, the honor of playing for you, man, 20 some years ago. So this is uh this is an honor for me, man. <laughs> man, how about that? It's like exact like 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 o three o four season is when you guys mm-hmm. you guys took over uh, down in yep. Waco. So yeah, that's 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 crazy. <laughs> Tell me, like just just yesterday, it really doesn't seem like it's been that long, and it's been so much fun to get to kind of watch your journey and and I man, I just can't can't imagine uh, this how this year went for you happening to a better person. So it's so awesome. I got to ask, like right off the bat, I mean, you inherited a program that won in, if if not the toughest conference, but one of the toughest conferences in the in the country. You inherited a program where you had a lot of players in and out. I think how how many did you actually have back on that team from the previous year? Two, two guys. Two. From the previous year. So yeah. brand, brand new team. I mean, what was it like walking into that? And you know, culture is a buzzword that's thrown out a bunch, but setting a culture where there really was none from scratch what was that like well man it was great to start with a blank canvas yeah right uh the two guys who stayed uh they wanted to be a part of something something new and and you know something exciting we talked about winning you know and how that was you know everything we was going to do was going to be uh, could contribute to winning and if you didn't get up every day and the decisions that you made wasn't about winning, then you were doing the wrong thing. And they they understood that and they wanted to be a part of it. So then we were able to bring in guys that fit who we were about. So every guy on the team was, was our guys. It wasn't like we was coaching somebody else's guys. They were all ours. So yeah. uh, Blank Canvas w- was awesome. I tell you, it's funny. Um, on Monday was our first individual uh, for this upcoming year and walked in the gym and there were six guys in the gym uh, and bodies they look like big 12 basketball players and had a big smile on my face because you know the year before there were only two guys in there <laughs> you so tripled it, it coach in one year man, man it, it was awesome <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> you know i love that video uh, of, of the the talk you had in front of your team about winning it's been out on the internet but when i when i got it when i saw it i clipped it and i showed my guys because I think sometimes, uh, like I'll have parents tell me, most of the time when they're upset that you know what you're just all about winning. Yeah, this program is only about winning, and and it was refreshing to see. I think the way that you used winning uh, to me, it's a like it's it's like excellence. Yeah, we are going to be about excellence with everything we do, and and winning is a part of that. But tell me what it was like, just about 
kind of setting up that culture from the very beginning with winning? Well, you know, um, we talk about like winning a day, right? And if you can win the day and you stack those good days on top of each other, um, you know, that's how you get the results that you want on the court in life, academically, you know, just everything. That's how you do it. And so what does it mean to win the day? And so we, with us, it's about going one and oh, and not one and oh in the day, but in every aspect of the day, you know, did I get up on time? Right. Did I what did I eat for breakfast? Did I go one and oh for breakfast? Did I if it was a lift, did I go one and oh in the lift? Did I go one and oh in my individuals? Did I go one and oh in study hall? Did I did I sit in the front of the classroom and take good notes and really stay focused in class? And did I go one and oh in that class? And there are some classes and or some aspects of the day where maybe you didn't go one and oh, but you know what you have to do is reset and move on to the next thing. And let's go one and oh in the next thing. Cause my definition of toughness is the ability to do the next right thing. And so we're always talking about doing the next right thing. And so that that's how we approach every aspect of the day. And if we can win, go more one and O's during the day, then we win that day. And then we stack those type of days on top of each other so that we can, like you say, develop those, those excellent, those habits of excellence. It's a great example of being processed based and and focusing on what you can't control because i would imagine if you walked into your situation a year ago and said listen next year elite eight that that's our goal like that that's what we're shooting for even though it is national championship or state championship like it is the goal i mean it's what we're all fighting for but golly it's hard to get there and and if you if you only focus on that you skip the necessary steps with i think with your mentality you just basically, I mean, what do we want? We want our guys to not have regret and to really attack every day. And I think that one no mentality, I love that you say that after wins and losses on social media, because I've, yeah. I've, I've watched that coach. Like, that's really special, man. Well, yeah, you know, you, what's next? You know, what, what's next? Let's go one and oh. And I actually said to the guys in that first meeting that next year at this time, we're going to be in the NCAA tournament. Um if but we have to do these certain things and so it was uh you know big picture but how do we do it what are the 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 little steps that you have to take that are so important and you can't skip them yeah and i think the one lesson i learned from you is to define what winning is and make sure that you actually do talk about that because there's this whole idea too like don't talk about wins and losses don't talk about only focus on process, but it's it's how you define winning. If winning is only games on the court, then yeah, maybe that's the side of winning that you lose out on the relationships, you lose out on the day to day grind. But to me, the way you're talking about winning is it's the process and it's how you do everything. It's not what you do, but how you do what you do. Yes, yeah, most most definitely. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Bology. Manage and measure your players' skill development and increase accountability year-round utilizing the Bology app. Boost inter-squad competition with drills backed by the National High School Basketball Coaches Association, including a 40-shot Bology skills assessment. Please visit Bology.com teams for information on how you can provide this resource for your team. I've known you for, like we said, 20-plus years, and I've always been an inspired coach by your energy. Uh, it's infectious. It's contagious. But it's also real. Like, I don't know. You watch the videos of you uh, jumping up in the crowd and dancing, which it's so outside of my comfort zone. And and, and so, like, I'm inspired that you would do that. But just so everybody understands, like, because that's who you were 20 years ago as an assistant on a team with only six scholarship players. You were the guy beating the metal can in the locker room as we're going out. So, like, just if, if people are wondering, ah, it's just because he's on that stage now. No, no. <laughs> but but I also know a lot about your faith, and I know how you are as a husband and, and as a dad. What habits, uh, daily habits, set you up for success? Well, um, you know, I, I, I get up early and uh, start start my day early. Uh, I start my day with a, a great cup of coffee. That, that that's very important. Um, I I listen to uh, some praise and worship music, and I 
I listen to either some sermon or a podcast, a leadership podcast that that's going to help me uh, lock in. And and then I before I leave the house, I make my side of the bed. And because um, my wife might still Ray might still be right. asleep or whatever, but like I, I make my side of the bed. And I'd heard that um, you know the Fortune five hundred company CEOs that like ninety two percent of them get up uh before 6 30 in the morning and uh it's like an 80 percentile rate that make make their bed they start their day with a win yeah and so th- those are those are the things that i i try to do habitually got two th- two questions there how do you drink your coffee black well you remember when we first got there and coach driscoll i never drank coffee before i got to baylor i was 37 really? years old yes when i got to baylor i was 37 years old had never drank coffee and Coach Driscoll turned me on to coffee, and it was a little bit of coffee and a whole bunch of French <laughs> vanilla. And so I would tell the people, what if I go to order coffee, they'd say, how you want your coffee? I'd say, uh, just like my wife, light, sweet, and hot. <laughs> and so now I, I like my coffee just like my wife, strong and black. <laughs> I love that. And it- Golly, if there's a guy that doesn't need any coffee, it's Coach Driscoll. So, but <laughs> with that combination of sugar, no wonder he was just, you know, all, all, all over the place. Um, second is uh, the podcast. Any anybody in particular, or uh, you probably listen to a bunch of people, but anybody that you find yourself kind of hitting again and again. Yeah, well, I'm I'm, I'm drawn to John Maxwell, right? But um, uh, and and. I don't know why his name is slipping my head right now, but I'm, so I'm going to pull it up here on my phone so I can, I, sure. I don't get it wrong. But um, the corporate competitor, right? It's um, it's how sports shape today's biz, business icon. Mm. And uh, Don, Don Yeager is the host. Oh. And he has a bunch of different um, corporate icons who had some kind of sports background, whether they played in high school or college you know, and how he talks about how sports helped them become uh, the CEOs that they are and shape their leadership uh, skills. And man, they're, they're just some of the best uh, podcasts. They've been so helpful for me. Go back to that word culture. Uh, yeah. It's it's a buzzword now, but everybody's always had one. It's all it's either been good or bad, and they've been conscious of the direction, or or they haven't realized really where they are. But I would feel like. You've always been conscious of that going from, you know, being such a huge part of the Baylor culture for years and then taking over a new program. How much of that did, did you take with you? How much of K-State basketball and the culture is, is unique to you? Well, I definitely, I mean, there's so much that I learned from Scott and what we did at Baylor and, and how he built team chemistry and, and staff chemistry. Um, and allowed us to have input on it, right? And uh, so I, I did bring a lot of those, um, a lot, a lot of those attributes into what we wanted to do. I just wanted to make it mine. And for me, you know, people talk about family, and um, I, I, I like to talk, say that we have a family reunion here. Like it's not, we're not just because if the only time you spend time together is at the office or on the basketball court, you're really not a family. Hmm. Right, so we do um, every during the summer. Every Sunday, we have a, a family dinner over one of our houses, either the coaches, one of the coaches' houses, and it rotates. And uh, I say I want our guys not just to know where the bathrooms are, but to know where the forks and knives are, you know, and like to really feel like they're they're at home when they come to our houses. And uh, up and down my hallway, I've got. Um, you know, Yurk Malagi, who I've known since he was 18 years old. I was at his wedding, at his baptism, at his dad's funeral. You know, um, Dream Dowling, you know, I've known for over 14 years, and uh, I performed his wedding. Uh, Marco Bourne, I've known for 20 years, it seems like, and uh, my son was in his wedding. Hmm. You know, I, I mean, you know, it's just like uh, these are guys that I've lived life with long before we've ever worked together up and down this, this hallway. And, and I want, the way that I've they've loved me and I've been able to love them uh, from a distance and now we get to do it every day. I, I want our guys to see that and then 
in turn emulate how we love each other with how they love each other. And I want them to see us how we love our wives and how we raise our children. And because the, I mean, you can tell them anything you want to, but they're going to, they're going to see how you live. Yeah. And that, that's what they're going to really absorb. And, and so like the famous pastor who said, you know, every day preach the gospel and, and sometimes use words, you know, that's what we want to do with our lives. Yeah. I, I saw that in the press conference. I think you, you mentioned that as well. And, and one, just really appreciate just how open you've been with sharing your faith, but, but it is, it's an, it's a way that I think we can all aspire to, which is not, not preachy, uh, not over the top, but just real and authentic and uh, uh, just living in a way that I think we can all uh, mimic. And it's just uh, really refreshing to see that coming from Baylor, where uh, it's a it's a Baptist school. I think I, I think it still is. And, uh, and but, you know, you you are it's a private school. You're able to be open going to K-State. How are you able to navigate those waters where? I think sometimes you, you when you change venues and you might be a little bit worried. Or were you pretty upfront and honest at the very beginning of this is who I am, this is how I'm going to talk, this is what we're going to represent, and how has that been for you? Yeah, you know, um, in, in my interview, uh, I told them if they wanted me and the best version of me, like it, it comes with Jesus, right? Like that's the best version of me. Um, I, 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 I share my faith but I don't push my faith. Like I believe everyone should embrace their faith. So we had Isma Sood and um, Bebe this year, and they're both Muslims. And we provided opportunity for them to, you know, they could go to the mosque and, you know, for them to to be vocal about th- their faith and live their faith and, and, and embrace it. And, and we have some guys who, you know, they haven't embraced any form of worship or faith yet, but, uh, they they also have the freedom to do that. For me, my my faith, how I live my faith, calls me to love people. It doesn't call me to judge or proselyte or mm. change, but just simply to love. And Jesus said that you know people will know you're one of my disciples if you love one another. And so that that's what we're called to do is just love. And I and to me, if I, we want to lead with love, and if we lead with love and set aside judgment and set aside. You know, like people don't have to vote the way I vote. They don't have to worship the way I worship. They don't have to look the way I look, you know, and, and eat the things I eat. But I'm required to love them and love them unconditionally. And and that that's what I hope that the culture of our program is that we're caring and we are loving. And then we operate with this great joy and our guys get to play on the court with freedom. So that, that that's what we're about. Man, you nailed it. Like the way you just described, if I was going to just watching your teams play, even on TV, you can see it from the way you talk to your players, how they talk to each other, how they address each other and treat each other on the floor. Like that just comes through, man. So Because some guys, some guys will say that about their culture. This is who we want to be. But it's almost as if they're really saying it maybe for the future or perfect world scenario. But to really hear it, like you said, but then have seen it in action, man, that's something special. Thank you. Let's go into that a little bit. I'd love to hear what the pillars of your program are. Since you said you're taking some things from Baylor, but then making this your own, you know, if you, I'm not not talking t-shirt or acronym or things like that, but what words, kind of what you just said a second ago, what words are important to you and your program? Uh, You know, I said a love joint. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and coming out told that we're going to be passionate. Well, first we're going to be tough <laughs> and then we're going to be appreciative because I've never met anybody like you can't be thankful and complain at the same time. Right. And so like, we're going to be appreciative and we're going to be passionate. Whatever we do, we're going to go be all in and, you know, balls to the wall with it. And uh, so those, those are the three things there. And, and then we talk about love, joy, and freedom all the time. And uh, it's just, I, 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 I hope that I, I know what's coming across when you hear the guys using the words. Nice. You know, when they talk to each other in the language that we talk and and it is a language, right? Culture is just not, not just about, you know, code words or whatever, but you know, it's how they live and and then you develop this certain language within each program and you know it's it's you're getting it if your managers say it as well as the the, the best player or the, the head you know what i mean like everybody's speaking the same language and that means that you've got to be pretty consistent with it though 
because if you're if you're not consistent with that language and living it out every day uh more is caught than taught you can just say it occasionally but they're not going to catch it unless you're living it every day right and, and, you know what crazy matt uh, i write the exact same thing on the board before every game for uh, the exact same thing and we're, we're not going to change this is what we're going to do this is what's going to look like this is what we're going to stay focused on because uh i remember dave aranda said this uh the head coach at baylor uh, for football and uh, he said, we just want to do simple better, right? And uh, I tell our guys all the time, simple is hard, but yeah. we just want to do simple better. And because the game is very simple, it, you know, it's just hard to do simple. <laughs> I, I think a lot of uh, not just high school coaches, but coaches in general, um, maybe fail in that arena because there is so much that we could do. There's so many choices that you can make defensively, offensively, a uh, tempo style of play. And then you then you even look at your personnel and see what kind of fits with that. But well, how do you get to that point where instead of trying to be a jack of all trades, master of none, you're choosing to be great at a few things. How do you get there? Um, we kind of just look at what's important to winning, right? Um, to, and so. Um, on the, you know, offensive end, uh, don't turn the ball over, right? Get a shot up every time, you know, and uh, on on the defensive end, you know, limit them to one shot. Keep the ball out the paint and limit them to one shot. You know, um, try not to foul. Like, there, that's, you know, just, you know, just try to keep it really, really. And then what can our guys do that's simple and they can do it the most effective? Like, there's a lot of things you can do to confuse the other team. Mm. Right or make it hard on the other team, but in in the process of doing that, you might be making it hard on yourself. Okay, and so my That's philosophy, a good nugget. Yeah, my, my philosophy defensively is that uh, mismatches don't hurt you, but open shots do. And so we just try to like make it as as simple as possible. And as we're talking about different schemes or what to do, we try to figure out what's the simplest thing, not necessarily easiest thing, but what's the simplest thing for our guys. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Shoot360. The future of basketball has arrived in Dallas-Fort Worth. Shoot360 combines the latest sports technology with the fundamentals of basketball skill development. The result is a -a one-of-a-kind video game-like basketball program designed to improve your shooting, dribbling, and passing. Visit Shoot360DFW.com to learn more and register for your free one-hour workout evaluation. Shoot360, the future of basketball is here. We've kind of taken the the year that Marquise Noel had and your first year to coach him. I mean, you're coming in with this idea of winning, but there are, besides him and another player, there's, you know, 12 to 14 other new pieces around. So you're trying to build this culture and identity. And he was, he was so much fun to watch. And, and, and a fun, it looked to me like a phenomenal leader. What did you do to kind of build confidence in him to be able to, man, just have the season that he had, play the role that he played. I, I got out the way. You know, like, he he has played a lot of basketball. You know, Marquise is 23 years old. He's played a lot of basketball, been around a lot of really good coaches mm. in his life. So he sees the game a certain way. And um, early on, I was trying to get him to see it the way I see it, right? And uh, we always say there's a lot of ways to get to four, right? Two plus two is four. Two times two is four. One plus three is four, you know? And so there's a lot of ways to get there. And when I got out of the way and uh, really God just taught me the lesson of, you know, that he's my guy and stop comparing him to everybody else, and, mm. you know, and learn to see the game the way he sees it. And when we both decided to do that, I apologized to him that I was trying to make him see it in a way that, that wasn't going to allow him to operate in his strength nor play with confidence. What makes him great is the edge that he plays with and the swag and the confidence that he has, right? And I was limiting that, and he was limiting it trying to please me. Mm. And so when I got to where I got out the way and said, look, I want you to be you, and and we're going to – I'm going to help you see it a little bit the way I see it because I believe in the last five minutes of the game, if it's close, you know, our staff can help us win the game. Right. And but to get it there, you have to be who you are. And I'm going to try and see it 
through your eyes. And we, we came to that compromise and, and I got out the way and, and that young fellow was able to blossom. Man, I, I get that because he was making some plays and, and some decisions, the shooting from 30 feet, uh, some difficult finishes, leaping to pass, a lot of no looks and, and higher difficulty passes. But it's not that other players can't do that. But most of the time, they're either not straight up not allowed or there's too much <laughs> fear involved. So yeah. I think you're right. You, I think you took what he does really well and then just poured gasoline on it. You know, instead of <laughs> asking him to be less, you asked him to be more and to do everything that he loves to do. But just with and I, that, I think it's a lesson for all of us. See, really notice what your players are capable of and don't handicap them with fear. Uh, or to put our own shackles on them with maybe because we couldn't do that. Cause I couldn't do any of the things he could do. <laughs> so, right. if, and, yeah. you know, our coaches taught us, you know, th- keep both feet on the floor. Yeah. You know, when you throw a pass, don't jump in the air to throw a pass. And, you know, there are times when I had to get him to do that. He had to understand those times, but there were times where I needed to move a piece so that when he left his feet, that it, wasn't putting him in a turnover situation. So, you know, lift the big and and then give him that driving lane so now he can leave his feet and throw the pass because it, it, he has a comfortability in that, you know? And, yeah. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? So it was, it was us trying to figure out how to put him in the best situation. And then he learned time and score. He really, yeah. uh, he really embraced understanding time and score to, to help the team move forward. I think, too, we got to understand that for other players now watching him play, it doesn't mean just because it works for him and the relationship that you guys have that necessarily as an eighth or ninth or tenth grader, that that's what they should be trying to do. Because like some guys, I would imagine like him, where I might be playing checkers when I play. I mean, they're playing chess like they're actually even when he leaves his feet, it's not based on hope. And to your point, there's a scheme involved where he knows where guys are going to be, but he also has the ability to see almost what's going to happen. And part of that is just his skill, God-given ability. But anyway, yeah. just really cool to see the combination of you guys, your, your ability to to give him confidence and allow him to do it, and then him just kind of taking that forward. It was special. It was fun to coach. So from year to year, even though you do have the ability to recruit and go out and get the players, like you said, your guys, you know, that are tough and all those things, those guys are pretty, he, he's unique. Do, are you, does your style change from year to year uh, based on the players that you have? Uh, like, for instance, are, are you going to have another guard shooting 30 footers and doing those things? And I guess maybe the answer is, well, if he can, or are does your style stay the same no matter what players are in there? Yeah, no, um, you know, we're going to recruit the best players and then figure out how to put them in the best situation to allow the team to be successful. I do want to recruit 30-foot spacing, though. Like, I want to find guys who can stretch the floor and um, and shoot it from deep because it just adds a whole nother layer to your offense helps all the other guys become better too because you know offense is spacing and spacing is offense right and that, that's rick majerus yeah. and i just want to uh you know so i i do want to recruit that and but i'm gonna hopefully be able to help guys operate be the best version of themselves yeah. not try to be somebody else toughness uh, i mean i read jay billis's book toughness and it, it's it's something that's like you can see it. It's kind of harder to find. RT Gwynn. Yeah. Yeah, R- RT Gwynn, uh, he's still playing overseas, Coach. It's been like 20 Man. years. He's still playing. That's because he can shoot that. That's thing. no doubt. That's the last thing to go <laughs> right there. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, he, I was there a few years with him even before you guys came. And he's a 6'10", really strong guy with just the smoothest shop of people. And I need to say people like the message boards, fan things that would get frustrated with this. He wasn't going to bang down low and he wasn't going to do some of those things, but they didn't appreciate the fact that he was our best three point shooter at his size. But like, there's this idea of, so can you make a guy like RT, not that he wasn't tough, but a guy, can you make players tougher? Um, or are they are who they are 
and, and or, or even how do you define that? How do you define toughness? Well, I t- for me, uh, my definition of toughness is the ability to do the next right thing. All right, and that that's like the to me that's, that's the most important thing. Did you turn the ball over? What's the next right thing? Sprint back on defense. If you slouch your shoulder and drop your head, that's not the next right thing. Okay, so now you let one mistake lead to two. You know, if you uh, fail a test, the next right thing is go talk to your professor and see if you can do a makeup. You know, like not hope it's going to go away and you know that kind or you know go out and make another dumb decision. Well, I failed the test, so. Well, I'm not going to do this project because I can't pass the class. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, when you have an argument with your wife, you know, do you leave the house? Just uh, do you the next right thing? Do you go and say, okay, my fault, I I messed up. You know, I mean, like so that that just what's the next right thing? And I think uh, for players, if they think in that aspect, then they don't get caught up in what's going wrong, right? Mm. They they okay, well, how can I make it right? And uh, so people, when they think of toughness, they think of hitting and pushing and yeah. grabbing. And, and and that's not necessarily toughness, you know. And so because I've got guys who are not they're not soft, they're just not strong. So what do we have to do? We got to get them in the weight room, yeah. right? They're not afraid, you know, to, to, to do the work. They just it's going to take time for them to get this. So I do believe guys can get tougher, but the, the, the place I think we can get them tougher the quickest is mentally. Yeah, And if we can do that, then the physical toughness or the willingness to be physically tough um, is, is easier for you. Man, you're right on the money. Because I, th- I think so many players think of toughness as, okay, I need to be physically tough, which means I need to be intimidating or I need to react in a negative way. Uh, and, and from my personal experience, uh, picking a fight with Horatio Yamas who was a seven foot, 300 pound player in Mexico <laughs> in my mid twenties and him breaking my eyes. That wasn't tough. That was stupid. But I think that's what I, I did it because we were getting beat and I felt like we weren't very tough and coach, I'm going to show them, Hey, I'm going to bring some tough. Now, that's just dumb. I think you, what you're talking about is control. Yeah. Toughness yeah. is being able to control those impulses when they happen. And, and, to like everything that you've said today, yeah, this this helps in basketball, but man, more importantly, that's a life lesson. And you just mentioned it with all those attributes. Yeah. Well, I heard uh as actually listening to, to corporate competitor pod this morning, finishing it, uh Denise Carroll. Uh I think she's with XM Radio now, but she's done a lot of other things and was a former soccer player at, at Notre Dame. And she talked about the sprints that they had to do at the end of practice, right? And how uh coach told them you always have 10 more minutes in you right like you know you run those sprints and you think man i can't do another (laughs) one right but you always have 10 more minutes in you right and that's the mental tough that's the toughness that you got where you know i always have 10 more minutes in me now that other dude may not think he has it in him even though he does but i know i got it in me right and so you know, we're, we're going to win these le- next 10 minutes because he's tired and he thinks he's tired. Uh, so that, that was a great lesson that yeah. I, but, I learned today. But coach, when you're recruiting, like, how do you, how do you find that out? I mean, I obviously you could talk to a high school coach, select coach, talk to family and try to learn a little bit more about their character. But there's a part of it that, you know, you might just find out when, you know, when they're running ferals at 6 a.m., <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, you know, you might find out in the weight room or something, but is there a way when you're recruiting to know that this guy has that ability to go 10 more minutes? You know, uh, for transfer kids, right, I think we can get like a lot more research and a yeah. lot more data on them because they've been with a strength coach. They've done a 6 a.m. run and then had to go to class and then came back and did an individual and and then – you know, had to to do a weightlifting session and then play open gym and then turn around and do the same thing again the next day, right? They've they've done that so we can find out, hey, who shows up to treatment, you know, afterwards to prepare to prepare to win? You know, oh. like who's the the person who um, you know, shows up early and and you know gets themselves warmed up so that they can have a good lift and who drags in late and you know, who stays after practice and gets up extra shots. And who's the guy you have to run out the gym? So we can do that with high school kids. It's a little bit harder 
right, to do that. But for me, I, I want to find guys who have won, right? Guys who have won state championships, they understand in a single elimination tournament, yeah. right, that at some point in time, you're going to be down and you got to get in that huddle and you got to say, fellas, we can do this, we can turn it on and, you know, and come out and win that, that you know, come back, whether, whatever the adversity is, overcome it to win that last game. And guys who have done that, they, they understand the sacrifice that it takes to win, and they're more willing to, to make the sacrifice for the next win. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high-quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. I think I'm guilty of having a little bit of tunnel, even at Grapevine Faith Christian School, small taps of having tunnel vision of only worrying about the basketball program and not really getting outside of that very much. I was blown away this year following you on social media, but also your basketball program, just how active you were in the community um, and with, with, you know, sitting with students and answering questions on campus with jumping up in the stands after why was that important to you? And I, I guess, why would you recommend uh, as high school, college coaches that we invest more time with students and the school? Well, I, first of all, I have a couple of kids, my own kids, seven and I that are both students here at Kansas State, right? And I know that there are some professors, teachers, teaching assistants, employees of the university out there that's going to run into them, have contact with them, and have a chance to have an impact on their life. Okay, and um, Horse Swartz, uh, I'm going to to say his name right, Horse Swartz, who's the the CEO of um, Ritz-Carlton, right? Um, He says, uh, do for one what you wish you could do for all. Okay, and so my interaction with students on campus, my giving out my cell phone number to the 3,000 freshmen and telling them if they need anything, they can give me a call or shoot me a text, you know, um, is what I wish, I hope that someone will do for my children, Mm. you know, and be there for them. So if I can be there for one, I would love to be there for all, which I know I can't, but if I can be there for one, I I, want to try and do that. I want, uh, I don't want us to live in a silo, like it's men's basketball and we're just over here. We are a small part of this great university. And I want everybody on campus and everybody, all the other athletic departments and all, I mean, the drama and the band and everybody to understand that uh, they play a valuable part in all of us having success. And so if you can do something that would make somebody's day special or make them feel good about themselves, I want our guys to understand how valuable that is. And uh, that that we're not in a silo, we're not by ourselves, you know, that that we're just a small part of this great community. Coach, you gave 3,000 freshmen your cell phone number? Yes, it was awesome. Your real cell phone? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Go ahead. My athletic athletic director, somebody was next to him when I was doing it, and they said, is that his real number? And he (laughs) says, yes. (laughs) <laughs> and then my phone starts ringing because they thought I, I said, hey, don't call me right now because it's going to go to what just shoot me a text. Man. Well, they started FaceTiming me. at the, And so I answered it at the while yeah. I was on the stage. And so they were fired up. But I got so much information about what was going on on campus. Hey, coach, we've got this going on here. We have this fundraiser coach. This uh. is going. To, and I was able to pop in some places when I could, you know, for five minutes and. Uh, you know, Coach, just, that's incredible, man. Like it, I, it, I, I mean it, that. It was like, awesome. Well, I, I, I can't. I think I stole that from Coach Driscoll. He told me he he's done that at North Florida, and and I said, man, when I become a head coach, I'm going to do that. And it's been, you know, one of the best things, if not the best thing, I've done. It's it's rare to be able to play for somebody that it, you feel like could be a pastor. And I felt like that about you and then also Coach Mills. So we had yep. two. Like when when your coaches can lead Bible studies that are legit and like and and you just feel like they have this knowledge. Um and that's special. What what are your some of your daily habits with the word and maybe over time that is really gotten you to the place where you're at as as in your faith? 
Well, I think as a teenager, uh, well, I know as a teenager, I was involved in this program in our church called Bible Quiz. And over the course of my teenage years and my early 20s being involved in that program, I had memorized close to 16 books of the New Testament. Right. So so the word of God was a part of me and it's it's a daily thing that I, I, I read and I met, I rehearse in my brain and it's part of my language and part of my, my, my prayer life. And um I I am like my calling is ministry. My passion is basketball, but my calling is ministry. So I, I I mean Coach Maloney used to say this all the time that um we teach basketball but we coach people. Right. And that, that's what this is about. Right. Ba- uh, basketball is just a carrot and the platform that God's given me to be able to minister and to love people. Right. Love these guys, love the community. And so that, that that's always been what it's been about for me. And um, the fact that you know, I can coach it a little bit, you know, could play a little bit. That, that, that's what the carrot is that allows others to want to listen to something that I have to say. How's Coach Maloney doing? What's he up to now? I haven't I haven't he's heard in, that name in, in a while. Yeah, he's in Florida. He just retired from being a high school coach with a very successful career down there and, and just doing wonderful. And he's trying to um get the ointment for that contagious rash that he has. Um, but but hopefully the doctors can find a cure for that contagious rash. Coach, <laughs> real quick the speed round. Uh, people, I mean, golly, people feel like they know you. Three thousand freshmen have your number. I I did want to ask a uh, how many 2 a.m. Uh, I need food texts did you get from the <laughs> not, not a lot of I need food. It was like, hey, would you come meet me at this restaurant and we can <laughs> or or hey, coach, we're playing a drinking game. Okay, <laughs> you you want to come over? <laughs> uh, I'm so glad that no videos surfaced. Of, no, um, that that's that's hilarious. All right. Coach, favorite ice cream flavor. Cookies and cream. Greatest shooter of all time. Ooh. Steph Curry. Texting or talking? Talking. Greatest basketball movie of all time. He got game. Good one. For high school, shot clock or no shot clock? Shot clock. Thanks, coach. Uh, Favorite holiday? Christmas. What book would you give to somebody? Uh, other than the Bible, um, man, that is a good one. You can always pass. Yeah, I'll pass on that one. Okay. Uh, favorite place to travel? Any island. Mm. Two more. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Ooh, about four. There you go. That's right, yeah. Coach. Own, <laughs> own that. Like, I get the people that are like, one. I'm like, How? Why do you just do one? All right. Last one. In basketball, who's the GOAT? Michael Jordan. You you feel good about that? Yeah, yeah. Although I'm a Magic Johnson fan, you know, Michael Jordan. Ah, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> Coach, this was awesome, man. And And just thank you so much for, one, your friendship. You are one of those guys that over the years, like, oh, oh, Coach, I only played for you for a year, but I still feel like I'm one of your guys. And and that just speaks volumes, I think, to you. But thank you. This was awesome. Oh, man, thanks for having me. This was an honor. And anytime, just let me know. I've just been so proud of you and, and blessed that you would call me Coach. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast share it with your fellow coaches and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.